looking for. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Uh, back in person uh, out there this year, we're really looking forward to that first uh, of the bigger festivals back in person. So we can't wait to get out there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see. All right, can everyone see that? All right, got a thumbs up from Luke. Yeah, so we looks great. Go. All right, so I'm here today to talk about Ecuador. Uh, Ecuador is one of my absolute favorite countries in the whole world. Well, used to pre-COVID, spent a lot of time traveling uh, all over the world leading birding tours. And Ecuador is always one that I was very excited to go back to no matter, no matter how many times I've been. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here today to tell you more about Ecuador. Uh, first, just a little bit about myself. Um, I live in Carmel, Indiana with my wife and daughter. That's my wife in the picture here with me when we were at Bird Fair in England a few years ago. Uh, I am the owner of Saberwing Nature Tours, as Luke mentioned. Uh, I'm on the Amos Butler Audubon Society Board of Directors, which is my local Audubon chapter here in the Indianapolis, Indiana area. And I'm also on the Board of, Director of, board of Directors of Ohio's Black Swamp Bird Observatory, uh, where I help to put on the Biggest Week in American Birding Festival. So, all right, let's hop into Ecuador here. So a uh, map here of South America with Ecuador highlighted in a uh, red circle there. Uh, you can see it's quite a small country um, compared to some of the rest of South America, but what it lacks in size, it makes up for in, in big numbers of birds. Uh, just a little closer up view of Ecuador there as well. Um, just some quick facts on Ecuador. It's about the size of Colorado. Uh, I have it against a map of kind of the Midwest there, uh, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, uh, 16 million people. Uh, one of the really nice things for Americans is that it is on the US dollar. Uh, so no converting any money uh, when you go there, you'll accept your US dollars. Uh, their official language is Spanish, uh, but most, uh, most places that you'll go birding have someone that speak English as well as Spanish. Uh, they are a leading exporter of bananas and a major exporter of roses, which uh, surprised me when I first started going there. And tourism is their third largest industry. So tourism is very, very important to Ecuador and ecotourism is one of the leading sectors of that tourism uh, market. So why go to Ecuador for birds? I mentioned that it was small, about the size of Colorado, but it has 1,691 bird species that have been seen in Ecuador. Pretty impressive for such a small country. Uh, that ranks approximately fourth highest in the world. Uh, I like to say approximately, because you get some of these countries started on arguing over who has more birds and it just, it gets uh, a little, little hairy there. And some people, depending on what checklist you follow and all of that, this is based on uh, Clement's checklist that we use for eBird. Uh, but, you know, there's lots of little arguments between the country over who has more birds. Uh, a really good two-week trip can have over 500 species, which is really um, quite the impressive two weeks. Uh, Ecuador has really good infrastructure, making it easy to move around the country. This is really important when you're birding and trying to get a lot of different species because with all of the mountains and everything, you're moving up and down in elevation and not, not having good infrastructure can take what should be an hour or two drive and make it an eight-hour drive. Uh, so it's really nice to have the great infrastructure around Ecuador. Uh, another reason to go is the friendly Ecuadorians. They are a wonderful people uh, and really, really welcoming, uh, especially, you know, especially the birding community there and the guides are really, really welcoming. And uh, there's always a smile on everyone's face and everyone's happy to, happy to have people traveling in their country. Uh, they have a wonderful series of lodges, uh, which make it very easy for birders to get around, have a great place to stay. Ecuador has fantastic food, not something I thought about going into uh, my first ever trip to Ecuador, but uh, their, their cuisine is, is fantastic and varied depending on where you are in the country. Great soups throughout the mountains and seafood on the coasts. Uh, so great, great place for, for good food. And this kind of goes to the, uh, the infrastructure that I talked about earlier, but it has easy access to a varied habitat zones. Uh, you quickly change zones as you go up and down the, the very high mountains in the central part of the country, um, and bird life changes drastically as you go through those zones. So I'm mostly going to focus here on this northern part of the country. I could talk about Ecuador for hours and hours on end, so I like to kind of limit my talk to a certain region. Um, 
So this area that's highlighted in the, the red square is what I'm gonna to cover today. And this is, um, you can see Quito right there in the middle. That's where everyone flies in and out of for the most part for Ecuador. Uh, that's their capital city. And um, it's actually quite high up in the mountains sitting about 8,000, 9,000 feet, depending on where you are in Quito. Uh, so walk slowly upon landing at the airport so you don't lose your breath uh, coming from so many of our sea level locations. Uh, and then you can see that you can cover both slopes of the Andes, both the east and the west here, heading you know, east down into the Amazon or west down to the Pacific coast. Uh, both great birding locations that I'll cover in a little more detail. And then you have that intermountain zone there uh, that we'll also cover uh, towards the end of my program. And then I'll have a little bonus coverage of just a couple slides of the Galapagos because I feel like you got to talk about the Galapagos a little bit if you're going to cover Ecuador. Um, so throughout this range that I just showed, there are some species that are going to be found in many, many places both on both slopes and at different elevations. And one of those is the beautiful flame-faced tanager. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to say real quick, all of these photos are going to either be from me, uh, my business partner that runs our photography side of our tour company, Brian Zwiebel, who took this shot, or our local equ uh, Ecuadorian guide, Edison Buenano, uh, will have some of the shots of species that I didn't have uh, photos of as well. But this flame-faced tanager is, is around both slopes of the mountain and uh, just a beautiful bird to see, even though it's quite common. Uh, these are chestnut-breasted coronets, one of the many, many, many hummingbirds that you would see while you were in Ecuador. Uh, they're very, they're beautiful hummingbirds. Everyone's very excited to see them at first, but they are the bullies typically of the hummingbird feeders. So you get tired of them after a little while because they like to chase everything else off. Uh, by the by, a couple days into the trip, most people are saying, "All right, could the chestnut-breasted coronets just go away for a little bit? We'd like to see, you know, some of the other hummingbirds without them being harassed as much." especially things like booted racket tail. Uh, booted racket tail is a beautiful hummingbird, very, very small hummingbird with a long racket tail. Uh, they occur on both slopes of the Andes. Uh, in this one, you can see that the little puff legs on it are orange. On the other slope of the Andes, they're white. Uh, just a little color variation, still the same species, but you'll get booted racket tails throughout uh, the entirety of um, the slope there. Another bird that can be found on both sides is white-capped dipper. It loves all of the fast-moving streams throughout um, throughout the mountains here, and really neat one to see. You know, we have our American dipper here in the United States. Um, another another dipper species here that acts very much in the same way, um, but I think a really really neat bird here. All right, so I'm going to move on to the east slope and some of the birding locations that I'm going to cover on the east slope. Uh, you'll notice that I refer to most of them by the lodge that covers them uh, because of the, the really cool birding lodges there. So we're going to start at a higher elevation at Guango Lodge and step down to Cavana San Isidro to Wild Samaco and then into the Amazon. Uh, so I'm going to start with Guango Lodge. Uh, Guango Lodge is a really quaint mountain lodge. Uh, you can see the building here on the top right picture and notice it's very, uh, it's a very quaint style, uh, lots of wood, lots of uh, boulders and you know, stone used to build this building, uh, very neat, neat place. Only, uh, only a few rooms, like six rooms, I think, seven rooms in the entire lodge, wonderful place to stay. And one of the coolest parts is that it has tons and tons of hummingbird feeders to attract all the higher mountain hummingbird species. Um, as well as some of the flower piercers that like to come into these, these same hummingbird feeders. And then you can just see a, a shot there of the, the entry to the lodge as well. Um, but some of the highlight species here are going to be long-tailed sylph, uh, really, really beautiful hummingbird species with a nice long iridescent tail. Uh, it has, I can't remember if I have a photo in it, um, but there's also a violet-tailed sylph that occurs on the other slope. That, unlike the booted racket tail, are separate species when you switch sides of the mountain there. Um, but the next bird I'm going to show is one of the major, major attractions here is the sword-billed hummingbird. Uh, this is the only bird in the world that has a bill longer than its body. And you'll notice that posture that it's sitting in with its head up with the bill kind of up and away. And that's actually, they sit like that all the time because of the weight of their bill. They like to keep their bill up like this. Uh, as you can imagine, this guy has a little bit of trouble feeding out of a hummingbird feeder for the most part. They like to use long... Uh, tubular flowers that uh, work for their bill. 
um, but really amazing species to see and always one of the species that people come to Ecuador saying they really, really want to get. Uh, this is a pair of tourmaline sun angels. These are both females and they were having a dispute over a feeder uh, when they landed like this and uh, were ve not very happy with each other at all. Uh, actually really, really angry. They didn't last like this for long before they went chasing off after each other, uh, but another one of the, the wonderful hummingbird species there at that feeder setup, as well as the collared Inca. Uh, as you'll notice, lots of the hummingbird species have wonderful names beyond just hummingbird and you know sun angels and Incas and all kinds of cool names for the hummingbirds down there. Um, this colored Inca can be a really hard bird to get a good picture of. You can see a little bit of that green iridescence in the wing, but it contrasts so heavily with that white throat and um, tail feathers there. Uh, so it can be hard to really get that iridescence, but this is a really good example of how it has that green iridescence on its uh, wing and back. Guango Lodge isn't just about the hummingbirds. They also have um, many other songbirds and the move through. Um, there's lots of feeding flocks of birds that move through the, the forests in this area. Uh, one of the really cool, beautiful birds is a turquoise jay that you see here in this picture. Um, but there, there's many species that call this type of forest home and uh, Guango is just a wonderful place to base yourself out of and to see all the birds throughout that region. Uh, this lodge sits at about just about 10,000 feet. Um, so it's up pretty high in the mountains there. It's between nine and 10,000 feet. Uh, of elevation. So we're going to move down slope here to about 6,000, 7,000 feet at Cabana San Isidro. Uh, Cabana San Isidro is a, another really neat lodge. Um, the, all these, these lodges I'm talking about on this slope, all three of them I'm going to talk about are dedicated birding lodges. Very few people stay at these that aren't birders. Um, so they cater to us really, really well. Uh, you can see this is set up a little differently. They have uh, individual separate cabanas. Um, but they're beautiful woodwork and you know space throughout the forest, really neat, neat place to stay. And Cabana San Isidro has a really interesting bird that draws people to it, and that is the San Isidro owl. Uh, the San Isidro owl is actually a yet to be described species. Uh, there is work going on to try to figure out whether it's a hybrid of two owls or if it really is its own species. Uh, but the San Isidro owl is one of the birds that you always want to try to see there because you might be seeing something that is uh, new and recently described to science and isn't you know, fully understood quite yet. And the cool thing at Cabana San Isidro is it likes to come in at night and hunt uh, rodents around the parking lot of, of Cabana San Isidro. So it's not very far to, uh, to get this owl most evenings. Um, like many lodges in, oops, oh, sorry, jumped ahead there. Like many lodges in Ecuador, uh, they feed ant pittas. Uh, ant pittas, for years and years in the tropics, if you got one ant pitta on a trip, it would be an incredible trip because they're so secretive and you can hear them calling, but finding them in the, on the forest floor walking around is extremely difficult. Um, year, several years back, a, a gentleman named Angel Paz uh, started to figure out how to feed them um, and I will talk about him more when we get to the other side, other slope, because his, he, his place is on um, the western slope of the mountain. But uh, because of his pioneering and feeding ant pittas, now most places you go, you can get to see several ant pitta species. Um, and here at Cabana San Isidro, they have a, a station where each morning they feed the white-bellied ant pitta. <clears throat> Another really cool bird at, in the elevation of San Isidro is Inca, or green jay. Uh, this is currently a, just considered a subspecies of green jay, although if you've been to Texas or, or parts of Mexico or Central America you, and seen green jay, you'll notice that this bird uh, looks quite different, um, but it is currently still the same species, but uh, I think maybe, maybe someday we'll see that one get split off into its own. Uh, another bird that you can find here in this area is a southern lapwing. It's a shorebird that specializes in, in grassy habitats. And I think one of the very, very cool, um, cool shorebirds. I know we had someone that said they were from uh, England on here, kind of a relative of your northern lapwing that you get to see uh, much more often over in Europe than we do here in the States. 
Um, another thing that Cabana San Isidro has been known uh, known for off and on over the years is a mountain tapir that will come into a salt lick that they put out that's visible from their uh, their patio their um, their big porch on the the main part of the lodge. Uh, it's kind of off and on whether you get to see this or not, but anytime you get to see a taper anywhere in the in the tropics, it's it's a good day, and so it's really cool that Cabana San Isidro somewhat reliably has one coming in. Um, also in the area around Cabana San Isidro is a, a river that's really great for torrent duck. Uh, torrent duck has a wide range throughout South America, but it's only on fast moving rivers. Uh, you can kind of see here how rocky and bubbly the water is as, it, as it's uh, quickly moving downstream. Um, and that's where you find these torrent ducks. And they can be found at, around Guango Lodge as well as, as San Isidro. But really easy to see. This is, uh, actually I had the picture of the male and female, very orange, um, looks quite different than the male that's um, white and brown. All right, so we're gonna drop down slope here again, just a little bit. And we're gonna go on to um, Wild Sumaco. And Samako is just a fantastic lodge. This was built and designed by a birder for birders. And Samako Lodge sits down closer to about the four to 5,000 foot elevation range. And you're getting into the Amazon foothills at this point, uh, which means your diversity continues to increase as you move down slope. And you'll know very quickly when you get to Samako that it's a very special place for birding. Um, it's way off the beaten path, uh, way off any of the main roads and highways. And uh, when you get there, hummingbird feeders everywhere, great birds to see. Um, and then it's nice to know that when you get into the rooms, there's nice little features that birders always like, places to hang all your gear and, and do things like that since it was designed by a birder. Uh, you can also see in that top left picture, awesome deck up there and there's humming, you can't see the hummingbird feeders in this photo, but there's hummingbird feeders and banana feeders all along the front there getting lots and lots of different species in. Um, so one of the species that's really interesting to get down in uh, the Samako area is Paradise Tanninger. Uh, that's one of the great things about getting down to this elevation. There's even more tanningers than there were in the other parts that we've talked about. And uh, they're all you know, incredibly diverse and beautiful, uh, different tanningers there. Another tanninger here, this one's a little, uh, more cryptic uh, than the very conspicuous uh, paradise tanager. The spotted tanager kind of blends right in uh, to the foliage. And as with so many of the other lodges, uh, lots and lots of hummingbirds. They have two different hummingbird feeding stations at Wild Samaco, one right outside the lodge and one uh, more in the forest down the road a little ways. Uh, and this is, a, this is a many spotted hummingbird that you'll see at both feeding stations, but a little different diversity depending on which hummingbird feeders you uh, go to um, throughout your trip there. Um, Samako also gets, you start to get into an area that you can start to get primates. And this black mantled tamarind likes to come in and steal as many bananas as it can uh, from the feeding station most days. So uh, they like to make daily appearances to come in and, and take all the bananas. Um, but Samako, uh, Samako is one of the, to me is so, such an interesting place because you can, you can go there and without even really driving around, you can walk around all day. They have tons and tons of trails and get quite the species list. I think in one day without using our car, we walked around, I think we had about 130 or 140 species just walking around their property. So diversity is really, really high and you don't have to go very far to get that incredible diversity. All right, so I'm gonna drop down into the Amazon now. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about one specific lodge. Ecuador is full of uh, lodges in the Amazon. Um, many of them are accessed um, out of Coca by boat. Um, lots and lots of different places to go. So I'm not gonna talk about just one individual, but just a couple of the different species that are really cool to find down in the Amazon. Some of the many, many species uh, that are cool to find down in the Amazon. Uh, the first one that on the screen here is Rufus Potu. Uh, potus are really neat birds that kind of look like a mix between a night jar and an owl in a way. Um, and Rufus potu is only found down in the Amazon and you won't get it at any of the other elevations um, here in Ecuador. Uh, so really neat one to see. This one was on a 
on a day roost um, that our that the local guides knew about when we went to go see a harpy eagle nest and a harpy eagle will be coming up here in just a minute. Um, more beautiful hummingbirds uh, like this fiery topaz. Um, really neat bird with that green throat, reddish body, that you know, split tail. Really, really cool hummingbird and, and only going to be found down there in the Amazon region. Then there's the harpy eagle. And the harpy eagle tends to be one of the most sought after birds you know, throughout the tropics, really. People, people have always been um, drawn to harpy eagle and to really want to see this, this incredible, powerful raptor that's, that's so big that those talons are so strong that it's known to just grab sloths or monkeys off the tops of trees when it's feeding. Um, and they nest in these huge trees uh, like this that you see here. This one was uh, leaving, I believe this one was leaving a nest uh, that had just dropped food at for its young. Um, but harpy eagle nests can be hard to come by and hard to find and can involve a little bit of effort to get to them. Uh, the, most, the, the most recent one I visited in Ecuador, I've heard there's an easier one now, um, but it involved about a, about a mile and a half to two mile hike out to, uh, out to the site where you could view the nest from. And although most of the trail wasn't too bad, the very end was a very steep incline up to get to eye level on a hill with the nest across the valley. Um, and it was quite the hike once we got up there, but, uh, you know, the nice thing is when you have young in a nest, you're pretty guaranteed the sighting of harpy eagle. So you just take it slow and, and get there and enjoy the other birds along the way as well. Um, but great place to see a harpy eagle when they when they have a known nesting location. All right. So let's, we're going to head all the way back up slope cross through Quito and we're going to go on to the western side of Ecuador here and we're going to cover we're going to talk about I'm going to do it a little differently um, but we're going to talk about places like the Mindo area which is one of the most famous areas in Ecuador for birding it was one of the first places to be developed for ecotourism and has been a long long time site for birders to visit in Ecuador and it's still a great place to base your trip out of when you're on the western slope of of the Andes here because um they have great lodges and it's easy access to a lot of the different habitats like the Tendiapa Pass, uh, Milpe Reserve, the Mosh P area, um, Solanche, which is down, um, down slope just a little bit more, but accessible by only about an hour, hour and a half drive. And then there's also access to an oil bird cave. Uh, so that's a really, really important, um, cool bird to be able to see. Uh, so when I'm on this side of, uh, of the Andes in the Western Slope, I like to stay at a lodge called Septimo Pereiso. And Septimo Pereiso is a, a wonderful lodge, great place to base your stay out of. As you can see in that picture on top, the top picture there, it's nestled in the, in the forest, in the rainforest there. So you have lots and lots of birds uh, just even at your lodge and just kind of the entryway there on the left through the through the jungle is really kind of a, a cool place, cool way to enter the property. So I mentioned earlier Angel Paz, and Angel Paz is is famous in the birding world. I'm I'm assuming some people here, at least some people, have heard of him. If you've been to Ecuador, um, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard of him because he he's definitely talked about a lot down there. Um, and Angel Paz you know, got interested in a bird that was kind of following him through the forest. And that bird turned out to be a giant ant pitta. And he'd whistle the call back to it and they'd whistle back and forth a little bit. And he finally started tossing some worms to it and feeding it. And at the time he had a cock of the rock lek on his property and had a few birders coming to see it. And he mentioned to, to someone that there was this really interesting bird following him around and, and they kind of freaked out. Oh my God, it's a giant ant pitta. It's so hard to see. And so as he perfected his feeding and, and attracting the giant ant pitta techniques, he's now able to show people this bird and up to five or six total ant pittas on a morning on his property after seeing a cock of the rock lek. Uh, so it's a must go place and he's been able to conserve the forest and has it's gotten more popular. Uh, his family does breakfast for the birders uh, later in the morning after you bird. And actually, I was just seeing that it looks like they built a, a new little type of restaurant up there. They have a few rooms to rent. If you were going to Ecuador on your own, it would be a really cool place to stay. 
Um, but you know, it's just amazing what he's accomplished here and, and how this has spread throughout Ecuador. Pretty much every lodge I mentioned, actually all the lodges I've mentioned so far are feeding ant pittas and, and that's really due to, to Angel figuring this out. Um, so another one that he's able to bring in there is mustached ant pitta, really neat uh, little ant pitta here. As you can tell, sometimes it's hard to photograph them in this area. This is shooting way down on one and in very, very dark conditions. Uh, so it's a little grainy, but really neat bird to be able to see uh, with Angel. Then you've got ochre breasted ant pitta. Uh, he also has names for all of these birds. Um, the giant ant pitta is Maria. I don't remember about the mustached ant pitta, but the ochre breasted ant pittas are called Shakira. It's because they, when they perch, they shake like the singer Shakira. Um, so kind of funny that he's you know, used that, but this bird is always shaking its wings a little bit whenever it lands on the branch, uh, which is a characteristic of that, that bird. I also mentioned that he has a cock of the rock lek uh, Cock of the Rock is just a fascinating, very bizarre bird um, that all the males come in and, and perform for the, the females trying to find a mate. And that's called a lek. And he happens to have one or two leks on his property and has a really nice setup with a blind. Uh, so the birds aren't disturbed and you can sit in there and watch them as they display in the morning. So also in this area, are lots of hummingbirds. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to give a you know two. I could I could load this. I could do a whole program on just the hummingbirds of Ecuador. A hundred and a little over 150 species of hummingbirds in in Ecuador. And a lot of our trips in this region get about 65 hummingbird species during a two week trip. Um, but I think the velvet purple coronet is worth a mention. You can see how just vibrant it is in this uh, image, and it's a really relatively common one uh, at some of the feeders. Another family of birds that I just absolutely love in Ecuador are the mountain tanagers. And this one's a black chinned mountain tanager, uh, several different mountain tanager species that are, are able to be seen here um, throughout the mountains in, in this northern part of Ecuador. Um, you can see coming into a, a feeder there, um, banana feeder which is so common um, now, a lot of, especially on the Western slope, um, there are lots and lots of feeding stations bringing in lots of cool birds, uh, like this mossback tanager. Uh, mossback tanager has always been, it's a very range restricted species. Um, and, you know, it, but the area near Moshpee has them coming into, uh, coming into banana feeders, as you can see here, perched up on top of the banana. Uh, my business partner, Brian, took this photo, but I was told I'm only allowed to use it with birders because no photographer wants their mossback tanager on top of a banana, but I don't mind it. It's cool that they come in uh, with the uh, eating off the bananas. Uh, there's also in the same area with the mossback tanager, there's glistening green tanagers coming in. Uh, this, this bird's just brilliant, isn't it? Uh, just an incredible glowing green. Uh, as glowing and green as this seems, it can be very, very hard to find out in the forest because it does just blend in so well with so much of the um, of the leaves and foliage out there. So even though these birds are just kind of brilliantly colored, they really can be hard to find out there. Another very interesting species on this side of the mountain and hard to hard to find. People, it's a sought after bird is this little tanager finch. Um, just a hard bird to find anywhere within its range. Uh, very, very neat little species though here and that chestnut color and the, the striped cap, very, very cool bird. Um, but in the Tandiapa Valley area is a good spot to see that species. All right, then I'm also gonna, on this side of the, the slope, I'm gonna talk about the oil bird. Uh, oil birds have a, it's a very wide range. The birds, oil birds are found you know, throughout the tropics um, in quite a few places, but they're never common and they're never e easy to see, but they, they roost communally. And many, many times it's in you know, deep dark caves. A lot of people have seen them in like Trinidad and Tobago. They have a very, a cave there that has a lot of them. Um, but in this part of Ecuador, the interesting thing is that they roost in a more of a um, very narrow, canyon 
And so instead of being pitch black, there's light that comes in from the top because it's open as in a canyon, not a cave. Uh, so it makes it a great place to get really good views of them as well as to photograph uh, oil bird. And you know, they can, there can be 40, 50, 60 of these all roosting within this, um, this cavern, um, this canyon area. And it's uh, protected by a local family and you have to, you actually have to take one of the family with you who has the key. They've put up a big gate so that no one can get back and disturb the birds. Uh, so we always pick up a member of the family to go with us and open up the the oil bird uh, canyon for us to go in and, and see these species. So it's a great way, you know, the tourism uh, of birders has allowed this family to, to feel like they should protect these birds and, and uh, really cool, you know, kind of extra effect of, of how birding can affect these local communities. All right, so we're gonna kind of go back into the central part of the country here, the Central Valley and the Paramo. Uh, Paramo is the habitat above tree line in these areas and there's some there's varying types of Paramo here and uh, really you know very to the species but the, the species that are really specialized and really cool to see. Um, so places up in this area are things like Yanacocha Reserve, Antisana National Park which is a really well-known spot, uh, Papajakta Pass, um, there's the Metropolitan Park in Quito, and then there's um, a couple places just outside San Jose, the San Jose de Puembo Hotel, which is where I like to stay because it's close to the airport, and then there's a place called Puembo Birding Garden that's in the same area, um, give you a good variety of, of the things in this you know, kind of intermountain region. Um, so this is a San Jose de Puembo. Uh, I like to base the first, you know, it's very close to the airport, so when you land and all the flights going into Quito for some reason like to get in late at night. I don't know why the airlines do it like that. So many of them go in, don't land till 10 or 11 at night and your return home flight is an overnight leaving at 11 or 12. Um, it's a bizarre thing the airlines do there but nothing we can do to control that. So we, we try to make the best of it and uh, stay at a nice airport hotel with a really big garden uh, as you can see in that top picture to bird in. Um, when you're when you're birding out in this area through the through the mountains, um, it's not just about the birds, but also this area has spectacled bear, and that's always something we're looking for when traveling through the high, you know, high mountains, high Andes. There is a to see the spectacled bears. Um, this one was photographed right near Papajakta Pass, um, which is these photos here. So this is Papajakta Pass. This is a wet paramo uh, and has a road that you can drive up that takes, you can actually drive all the way up to about just over 14,000 feet elevation. Uh, bring your oxygen mask, uh, it's thin there. Uh, Got to walk around slow. It's also about as windy as you can imagine up there. And although we might be going to the tropics, I always have hat and gloves with me for my time at Papajak the Pass because uh, it can be rather cold. Uh, but beautiful scenery, as you can see here, and we go up there for one bird in particular, there's several species to see, but one bird in particular, and that is the rufous-bellied seed snipe. Uh, really neat grouse-like bird uh, that specializes in that high wet paramo. Uh, you, can kind of, you can see here, interesting bird, very cryptically colored, blends in very, very well with the paramo in this region. Uh, but very cool to see. It's it's interesting up in Papajakta. You know, we have a couple opportunities when we do this tour to be able to stop there, because there are times that it is so fogged in you can't see ten feet in front of you, and we can't stop when it does that. And you you don't want to anyway. You can't find the bird, uh, birds that you're looking for with that much fog. Um, but there's there, you know we have multiple opportunities to try to offset that, and I've had very good luck overall. Uh, with some good weather up there so that we can get rufous bellied seed snipe. I've also been kind of sleeted on while we're up there too. So it's not always, not always beautiful weather, but you know, in these pictures that I had up before, you can see it's relatively clear when, when I took these shots and I've been up there when it's been as clear as you could actually see Quito uh, from the mountain up there. So a little bit to the south of Papajakta is Antisana. This is a, a large national park around the Antisana volcano. Um, you can see this is a little bit different habitat. This is a dry paramo, uh, so it doesn't get as much rain as the Papajakta area. And 
Uh, you can see some long grasses, a little bit kind of scrubby uh, trees and, and lots of grasslands up there. A couple more panoramic shots here. Uh, that top one, the road's not really curved like that. I just did a panorama and it curved everything on us. Um, but you can kind of get a feel for how big those grassland, you know, just big dry grasslands up there. And then that bottom photo at the end of the road, you run into a, a little lake up there and you kind of get a view of the lake here. And that has a bunch of, of nice species up there as well. Gets, gets some waterfowl, um, like yellow-billed pintail, Andean duck, silvery grebe, several other things like that. So a great place to stop all the way up at the top. Uh, but some of the birds that you're really looking for up here are Andean ibis. Uh, this is a, an ibis that specializes in the paramo habitat here. Uh, this is the northern po most population of this species. Uh, it also occurs farther south in uh, Peru and Bolivia as well. Now this next photo, although the birds are in almost exactly the same position, it's not the same species. I was flipping through my program before Early, earlier this morning looking at the slides and I was like, oh, I wonder why I included two and went back and it was, you know, different bird. This is carunculated caracara in almost the exact same flight position as the ibis. Uh, I just love the name to start with, carunculated caracara. It has to do with the, the facial skin you can see there on this bird. Uh, these are quite common up at this uh, elevation up in Antisana National Park and um, both flying around but also uh, running around kind of like you would expect from a cara cara uh, looking for food. Also up there, there's a pipit that's a, a paramo specialist, the paramo pipit. Uh, as you can see here, like so many pipits, it can be very difficult to find if it doesn't want to fly up or sing because it blends in perfectly with the grassland. Uh, but it's one that you're always we're always looking for up in the Antisana area. Uh, another lapwing, this is Andean lapwing. This specializes again in the paramo habitats up here in, in the high Andes. And then also, you know, as much as the, the ant pittas range all, you know, from Amazon all the way up to up to the high paramo, and this is tawny ant pitta, they can be a little easier to find uh, without so much dense foliage and actually there's a little um, office for Antisana National Park near the lake, and this guy likes to come out onto the lawn and stand and look around. And that's where this was photographed. So it can be one of the easier ant pittas to, to find. I'm also going to talk about uh, Yanacocha Reserve. This is part of the Hokotoko Foundation, which does amazing work throughout Ecuador in preserving properties. And if you don't know, Hokotoko is that ant pitta that's kind of feet that's on the uh, on the screen there on the little Hokotoko sign just to the right of my head. Um, but this was with a couple young birders that's family or clients of mine that we took to Ecuador, uh, wanted to pose as the hummingbirds on the sign. So uh, pretty cool entrance there to, to uh, this area, but this is a great spot. They've recently in the last few years put out more feeders, um, more fruit feeders around and it's gotten better and better for photography as well as just for birding in general at, at the feeding stations, things like Andean guan uh, come in. And as I talked about earlier, some of the, the mountain tanagers, this one is black chested mountain tanager. Um, really neat place to bird and, and getting better and better. I, I need actually to even add some more photos because some new cool species are starting to come in there. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a little bonus on Galapagos here. Um, I think you can't really talk about Ecuador without mentioning the Galapagos. Uh, if you talk to non-birders, the Galapagos are kind of what uh, Ecuador is known for overall, even though birders like the rest of the country as well. Um, when I do the Galapagos, we do a, a yacht that we rent um, just for a birding group that has can take up to about 16 people. So it uh, keeps the group nice and small, unlike some of the big ships uh, there in the Galapagos and gives us a great opportunity to really get to some of the great birding locations, you know, even though it's a relatively structured itinerary because of how Galapagos National Park works. Uh, but we get to see things like the giant tortoises here that are in front of uh, me here on, um, on Santa Cruz Island. And then also, this was on my first trip to the Galapagos. The uh, Galapagos penguins are known to come swimming with the snorkelers. Uh, so pretty cool to be in the water with penguins. Uh, 
in that area and, and actually to see a penguin species, you know, the farthest north penguin species uh, in the world. So neat to see. And, you know, as, as much as we would like to think because they're kind of tropical islands that the water would be nice and warm, this is the Humboldt current and this is cold water. Uh, so that's why we do get penguins this far north and the water, uh, the water will take your breath away, but the snorkeling and scuba diving is incredible. So people, uh, people get used to it, but the first jump in, it will definitely take your breath away. Uh, the Galapagos are also, they have varied habitats, um, very interesting islands. You can see the top left picture is on top of cliffs uh, and all those specks in the sky are seabirds. Um, that are uh, nesting throughout these islands. Uh, the top right picture is a big walk you can do up a staircase and then look out over uh, the island there. Um, and then I, I've always been, I'm always fascinated by this habitat on the bottom with cactuses and this really cool um, plants that are red there. Uh, kind of neat, kind of looks like a very susical type island to me. I've always enjoyed that one. And there's some really cool birds as well. You have your Galapagos finches, uh, the Darwin finches, and you know, about I, they keep splitting them. I think we're at 14 or 15 species right now. It might be a couple more now even. Um, things like swallowtail gull there on the bottom with a chick. Uh, kind of the famous bird of the Galapagos everyone thinks of, of blue-footed booby. Um, and then the, the right there is the, the uh, wandering albatross that nest. Um, on the islands, really, really cool, uh, huge, huge bird. They, and to watch their display on the islands is, is really neat. Um, but let's see, so that is all I have for everyone today. Uh, my contact info there and all of the tours that we have coming up in the next year for Ecuador are listed on the slide as well. And I'm happy to take any and all questions. Hey Rob, that was awesome. I'm gonna put, uh a link to your to state brewing nature tours here in the chat so people can check that out and of course i'll put that in the follow-up email too we did have a few questions come in um uh, so i'll pass those along so what is the best time of year to visit ecuador so ecuador is is nice in that there there's a lot of the year that you can visit ecuador um being right on the equator the weather is you know pretty norm, kind of normalized throughout the year, not a lot of variation in weather. Um, I've found that my favorite times to be there are, we do, we do a lot of our trips in September. Uh, weather tends to be really good in September. Um, and then we also do, we do some stuff in November, December, we do some stuff in March, um, all good. And I honestly, when, I've been there several different times, even beyond these times, and we've always had pretty good luck with the weather. The thing with the tropics now is, you know, we used to have pretty defined dry season, rainy season with climate change. It's it's a little trickier to be dead on about what what type of weather you're going to get. So, um, you know, I think think almost any time of year you can make the best of it and get some good birds. Yeah, that sounds good. Looks like a lot of your trips are yeah, a couple of them in September there. Yeah. Very cool. So um, another question was like, how safe is Ecuador compared to other places? Ecuador has been, uh, been a very stable country and um, is quite safe. Uh, you, you have to be careful of pickpocket and thing like that if you're in Quito. So if we do any city tour that we do on some of the tours, you have to, you know, we always are warning people to just be a little careful with their wallet and purse. Um, but but Ecuador is a very safe country overall. They did early on and still lingering. They've had their COVID issues like most of Latin America has uh, lagging behind in vaccination. And, and early on in COVID, they were really hit hard, um, especially along the coastal regions. Um, but things are getting better and better there. I've, I'm in contact a lot with my local guide that I work with there. And and things have been getting better and better. And uh, and they're they're hopeful things continue that direction. But from a from a personal safety perspective, Ecuador is a, a great country. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds like. Um, there was a question about like how long of a trip should someone plan there? As we see the, the length of your tours here. Um, yeah. So what, what would you suggest for like a, you know, for a first trip to Ecuador? 
Yeah, first trip to Ecuador. So one of the things that we've, you know, we had always done just two week trips because it's a long way to go. And most people were wanting to stay that long. We've, we've added over the last few years that our week in paradise trip that does a nice nine day, but is a little more focused. So you can kind of make any length of time that you want to be down there work from a week and up um, just by picking a specific region to do. Um, you know, when we do the week in paradise trip, we spend our time in the Mindo area um, that we, uh, you know, I talked about kind of in the middle of the program there, because you can base out of there and get a lot of species over that shorter period of time, you know, with, with eight or nine days, you could also do the Eastern, sl uh, slope and spend a couple nights at each lodge as you drop down. Um, a lot of people use the Amazon as like an extension to their tour. So they'll just do the lodges on the way down and, you know, some of the group will leave after that and then some people want to carry on to the amazon because the amazon does take some additional time actually it's because you gotta you have to canoe, you know motor motorized canoe into a lot of the lodges so there's you know there's travel days involved motorized canoe sounds awesome yeah it's pretty it's it's pretty cool to do those lodges <laughs> where you get on the river and then you're out there at the lodge it's it's pretty cool how many people uh do you have on your tours and how do you get around to use a, like a, a van or? So we, relatively, we put on most of our in 10 people. Uh, so we do smaller group tours. Let me see if I can flip back to this real quick. I'll show you the vehicle that we typically use in Ecuador. It was in the picture. All right, lots of, there we go. So this van here, this big, uh, Co Toyota coaster style. This is a Mitsubishi, but uh, Toyota coaster style. Our our plan with any tour is that everyone has a window. So no matter what the group, the size of the group is, we're aimed for everyone to have a window seat if they want it. Uh, so we like to have pe room for people to spread out, and um, we don't like crammed in vehicles because who wants who wants to be crammed in and miss a bird because they're all crammed in. Yeah, birding from the vehicle can be so hard sometimes. Well, a lot of the time. That's tough. Well, great. Uh, let me see. Oh, what time? This is a question for me, actually. <laughs> I don't want to. I'm asking this one. What time of year uh, do the Cock of Rocks uh, use their legs? I don't know the entire time frame. And some most of the time, there's a bird on it throughout the year. Um, young birds will get in and start practicing, but they're extremely wow. active in September. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I see that someone in the uh, chat were the second and third people to join on hell to see the giant ant pitta. That's super cool. Uh, and it's amazing where he's come from that. That's absolutely fantastic. Keith and Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Keith and Jan. I, I'm, I can see you guys being down there knowing you and I, I yeah, that that's amazing. It doesn't surprise me that it was you two down there, but um, that is pretty awesome. Let's see. Anyone else have any other questions for Rob? Feel free to um, either virtually raise your hand or unmute yourself. Uh, we have a little bit of time here. Anyone ready to go to Ecuador and sign up for one of these talks or one, one of these tours? Everyone's always ready to get there after, after seeing pictures. <laughs> I know how it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it for sure. I mean, well, need to know if you are going to repeat this at two o'clock this afternoon. Are you repeating the Ecuadorian presentation at two? My invitation just arrived in my email. Oh. Uh, no, no, just this one, but uh, Roland, I, I will be sending out the recording of this later this afternoon, so you can you can um, check it out at your leisure whenever you'd like. I appreciate that very much. Thank yep. you. No problem. I saw that we also got, we just got another question of if you go with non-birders, what would be a good place to go? Yeah, uh, Carol, that's a great question. Always a great question. Um, a couple of the places that we talked about would be good to go. Mindo has a, a variety of other activities um, that you can do. So that's a great place to go with non-birders where you can, can do some other stuff. 
Um, also right near Guango Lodge is a really cool lodge uh, that is a hot springs. Uh, so neat place to go with, with non-birders. I've taken uh, some people there that had spouses that weren't into the birding and they'd hang out with the hot springs and hot pools and stuff um, while, while we birded. So a couple different places there that would be good. But the birding lodges down uh, the Eastern slope would be tough with a non-birder because uh, that's mostly birding. Yeah, yeah, I was processing that uh, with my kids and my wife, how I would pull that off. We could figure it's a out. balance. Mindo would work for the wife and kids, probably. Okay. Mindo, I have that down. Yeah, because that has things, that, that has all the kind of like the, the fun rainforest adventure stuff uh, that they could do a little right. bit of. Right. Joanne was wondering when you go on one of your tours, do you go, do you bird all day or do you have time to, I guess, relax a little bit? Um, so uh, they're, the tours are pretty birding heavy overall, um, but we do get, we do tend to do breaks uh, through the middle of the day um, as activity wanes. Um, I see that she said I would want to do other things. A lot of the places that we go there wouldn't necessarily be other things to do like i kind of just mentioned with the stuff down the eastern slope um so that could be tricky but um, we do tend to have breaks during the day depending on the day and where we are but you know especially as we get into the lower elevations it gets really hot through the middle of the day and bird activity drops and so we tend to take take a break through that i most of the time end up sitting on the porch watching the the feeders and hummingbird feeders and stuff and end up with half the group still birding with me anyway <laughs> even though we're on a break so um, yeah but there are there are break times and downtime it's not a not an all day every day bird till you drop type thing because um that's never uh never fun for m most birders overall and then i see and cocktails Yes, I have yet to go to any of these lodges that don't have a bar. There's always a cocktail hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking was either a coffee or a beer on the deck uh, yep. watching the feeders. Like, that's my other thing. <laughs> yep. Well, and there's in Latin America, there's always coffee. It doesn't matter what time of day, there's always yeah, coffee. Exactly. So that's always good. And it's, it's normally really good coffee. Um, and, you know, you stand on the deck enough, you just drink coffee until you switch to beer in the evening and you're good to go. <laughs> There's a the perfect Ecuador trip right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, also you, saw, I also saw someone ask between the two September trips, what would you pick for the first time? I would do the exploring the Northern Andes first. Personally, that, that would be the first one I would do. Um, just based on the species list and what and what you get to see and getting used to uh used to a lot of the birds down there that's that's what i would do cool and peggy i see you asked that question you'll be able to uh talk to rob in person at the festival coming up and pick his brain a little bit more about, about ecuador oh one last question which or two of which trip can you see possibly the harpy eagle was that was in the amazon right it's in the amazon um actually right now we're the trips for 22 don't have a harpy eagle on them the, the birding and photography adventure at the end of this year does potentially um but i'm waiting to hear if the nest in that region is active um so it just we we will have more trips uh that have the harpy and actually every once in a while with the exploring the northern andes trip if there's a close by harpy nest when we're at um at uh wild Samako will actually make a quick little change and be able to go see it but um it all depends where it is from year to year so in the final question do you know robert ridgely do you go to any of his preserves so i i have met robert ridgely a couple times um i think that he is involved with is he involved with hokotoko foundation reserves i think I believe he's involved with the Hokotoko Foundation Reserves. Yeah. And yes, so, he is. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, the Hokotoko Foundation Reserves are fantastic. And actually, the Southern Ecuador trip, which is the Hokotoko Ant Pitta and the Timbesian endemics, we spend a lot of time at the Hokotoko Reserves because they have uh, really nice lodges down in the southern part of the country. Nice. 
Yes. Cool. Thank you, Rob. And uh, really looking forward to seeing you later this summer. Thank you to all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. I always uh, like it when people take themselves off of mute and show their gratefulness to our presenters verbally. Get, give Rob a, a good juice on uh, thank you, and then we'll head out. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Good job. Man. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. See you, Thanks, see you in Columbia. Yeah, can't wait to see you there. Get to this <laughs> afternoon. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks again, Rob. Really appreciate yeah, thanks, it. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple months. Yep. Have a good one, dude. You too. All right. Bye-bye.